Welcome to Sword of the Spirit, written and presented by Colin Dye, Senior Minister of Kensington Temple and leader of London City Church. Sword of the Spirit is a dynamic teaching series equipping the believers of today to build the disciples of tomorrow. We pray that you find these programs inspiring and a catalyst in deepening your knowledge of God, your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and your intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Hello and welcome to the Sword of the Spirit, a school of ministry in the Word and the Spirit. Our topic is Worship in Spirit and Truth. And we've been seeing how the Holy Spirit can bring us through difficult times and give us the ability to worship God with joy and rejoicing, no matter what our circumstances. Real biblical joy is more of a state of mind and a heart than an emotion. Sometimes we do have experiences in which our emotions are moved and we really feel happy and feel joyful. But really, Biblical joy is far deeper than that. Our emotions can come and they can go. The most important thing is to keep our heart fixed on who God is, because when we acknowledge who God is, then we, are, we have a joyful attitude. And with this joyful attitude, we can worship God with joy in all circumstances. Also, I believe joy is a kind of foretaste of the future. Because in heaven, we shall be so released from everything that could cause us pain or bring us down, so that in heaven, there will be nothing but joy and rejoicing. And the Holy Spirit, who is the heavenly gift into our lives, can bring us into an experience in which we foretaste heaven and taste heaven beforehand. And that's why we can rejoice in all circumstances. And the early believers who were persecuted and, and the martyrs of the faith were so joyful and, and rejoicing so much because they knew they were going to be in the presence of the Lord. And I think a very good definition of worship is enjoying the presence of the Lord. Now, at the outset of today's program, I'm going to do a brief introduction concerning the words for joy and rejoicing in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And we will see how these words bring us into a full revelation and an understanding of what it means to rejoice in the Lord. And I believe that as we study this topic today, God will lay a fresh foundation in our lives, a foundation upon which we can stand like standing upon the solid rock, knowing that God has given us a new song, a song of joy and a song of rejoicing. Because after all, that's our testimony. As the Bible says, he has taken us out of the miry clay and he's put our feet upon the rock. And we know that that rock is Christ Jesus. And he's also put a new song in our hearts. It's a song of joy. It's a song of praise and a song of rejoicing. Whatever circumstances you're going through today, listen carefully and watch attentively because I know God is going to give you a new spirit of joy and rejoicing. The Old Testament words in Hebrew for joy and to rejoice are simach, sim, simha, and sameha, sameach. These are the usual words for joy and rejoice. They are expressed in the celebration of the various festivals and sacrifices. And this is something that God developed down through the ages. He said, when you come together, I, I want you to celebrate. In recent church history, there have been the renewed emphasis, emphases on celebrations in different contexts. And one of the things that the charismatic churches have uh, contributed to the worship life of the body of Christ in recent history is to call people together for celebration. Thank God for the celebrations. Let's celebrate together. Who are we celebrating? We're celebrating Jesus. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Now, of course, when that turns inward 
and we be it becomes only celebrations, only partying, and we forget the misery of the world outside of our party in our little private holy clubs. And then when we realize that God wants us to weep for the lost and to cry great tears for those who are hellbound and, to, and not just to come together for Christian parties of celebration, but also to go into mission and evangelism, we don't forget that it was in a time of celebration that the church was born. 3,000 people came to Christ on the day of Pentecost when they were simply filled with the Holy Spirit and had so much joy that they couldn't contain it. That, to me, is what the witnessing experience is all about, is to have so much joy that it overflows in your life despite your circumstances, whatever they are, that you may, then it bubbles out to other people. And there you are so full of joy, and that joy becomes contagious, and they're standing next to you, and they go, <laughs> what is it? There's something strange here. And you say, that, my friend, is the joy of the Lord. Or you may not put it like that if you're actually witnessing to somebody. You may just then lead them gently into the realization that uh, you have something that God has given to you, but it's available to everybody. It's called happiness. It's called joy. It's called knowing joy. Jesus. Now, Simha was not only expressed at pre-planned events, such as festivals, but the book of Psalms shows that spontaneous joy was part of both corporate and individual worship. When was the last time you, in the presence of God, just lifted your hands and rejoiced before Him spontaneously because you're so thrilled with who He is? Psalm 4 verse 7 says, you have put gladness in my heart more than in the, in the season that their grain and their wine increased. Psalm 42 verse 4 says, When I remember these things, I pour out my soul within me, for I used to go with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise with a multitude that kept pilgrim feast. Joy is a particular theme of the prophet Isaiah because the prophet Isaiah is the John's Gospel of the Old Testament. He proclaims salvation more clearly and more fully than any of the other prophets, to my mind. And he therefore says this salvation will be characterized by joy. Isaiah 49, verse 13. Sing, O heavens, be joyful, O earth, and break out into singing, O mountains, for the Lord has comforted His people and will have mercy on His afflicted. Isaiah 61, verses 10 and 11. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for He has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robes of righteousness, as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. For as the earth brings forth its bud, as the garden causes things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all nations. So Isaiah had a vision of this joy. It's not surprising then that the New Testament will be characterized by joy. Hara and Cairo are the most usual Greek words for joy and to rejoice. They refer to intense joy. And closely related, this word is closely related to charis, which is the Greek word for grace. So the relationship between kara and charis must suggest that kara, joy, is the only appropriate response to charis, divine grace. So these two words are related together. Kara means joy, means joy. Charis means grace. So we are full of joy because the grace of God has touched our lives. Hallelujah. I'm getting excited here today. And in John chapter 15 and John chapter 16, Jesus establishes that the joy comes from Him and the result of this joy, the joy rather, is the result of fellowship with Him through His grace. Let me just read one of those verses for you. John chapter 15 verse 11. These things I've spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. The book of Acts shows that intense joy characterized the life of the early church. For example, we see that joy accompanied the gift of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. We find that the miracles performed in the name of Jesus Christ brought joy. Acts chapter 8 and verse 8. There was great joy in the city when the kingdom of God came and paralyzed were healed and demon, demons were expelled. The conversion of the Gentiles 
in uh, uh, the book of Acts was, was a, an occasion for great joy and celebration as they saw that uh, God was extending His grace into the Gentile world. When they were persecuted, they were filled with joy because they said, what a wonderful privilege is ours to be counted worthy of suffering, suffering for the sake of the name. And they also had great joy and celebrated together in the Lord's Supper. And they ate their bread with gladness and singleness of heart. And part of that must have been the breaking of bread together and sharing together in simple fellowship. In the letters of Paul, we find four basic facts about biblical joy, kara. First of all, the conversion and Christian progress of new believers was a cause of joy. When we see people coming to Christ and seeing them growing in Christ, it's one of the most wonderful things we can see. We get so happy. Suffering for the sake of Christ can lead to joy because it's the joy is the joy of the Lord. It's not produced by us, this joy. It comes from God. In Galatians chapter 5, Paul says joy is an aspect of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace. And also in uh, uh, the book of Romans, he says that this is the, the kingdom of God is characterized by righteousness, peace, and joy. Every believer is called to share in the joy of Christ by fellowshipping with, with him and also by rejoicing in the knowledge of him and his salvation. Intense joy is so based in grace that it is difficult at times to uh, look at the other reasons and occasions for rejoicing. In other words, this uh, grace that God has given us seems to pervade absolutely everything else. But we see that this grace opens our eyes to the other reasons for rejoicing. In the New Testament, the reasons for rejoicing are manifold. We're, call, we're called to rejoice in the Lord, in His incarnation, in His power, in His presence with the Father, and His presence with them or with us. Uh, we are called to, to rejoice in the ultimate triumph of Jesus in hearing the gospel, in rejoicing in people's, in our salvation, in receiving from the Lord and receiving the Lord, being enrolled in heaven, having our liberty in Christ, having our hope in Him, our reward from Him, and we rejoice in the obedience of other believers, we rejoice in the proclamation of Christ, even if it's preached by people who are doing it from unworthy motives, Paul says in Philippians chapter 1. The gospel harvest, we're rejoicing in that, suffering with Christ, Suffering in the cause of the gospel, suffering and persecution, the manifestation of grace, meeting with other believers, receiving tokens of fellowship, rejoicing, the rejoicing of others, learning of the well-being of others. All these things are listed in the New Testament as being occasions of great joy. And I list them for you today so that you will know every day there is something that you've got to praise God about very, very deeply. No matter what is going wrong with you, ultimately, Romans 8, 28 is the, is the final reason why we should rejoice, because God is working everything for the good of those who love Him and who are the called according to His purpose. In fact, God can make things which were bad that happened to you and not part of his perfect will for your life, he can make them so effective as a means for blessing and a means for the revelation of his glory that you could be tempted to think afterwards that he meant them to happen anyway in order to produce this result. God can turn evil things around for good in such a way that you can say, Hallelujah! God intended it for good. You intended it for harm, or the devil intended it for harm, but God's intended it for good. Just as a personal testimony, right now I'm facing a situation which I don't believe is from God at all. It is a demonic situation, and it's, a, it's, an, a, it's an attack against my ministry, an attack against what God has called me to do. But I am already seeing in this demonic attack the hand of God turning it right round and glory is going to come to God out of this and it is working for my good. I feel it. It's like God is, is surgically operating on me spiritually and I just feel the transformation that's taking place. And it's almost as if God is, it's almost as if I could be tempted to think God intended this to happen this way. Well, we know he didn't because this was demonic, but nevertheless, God, even the attack of the enemy is the thing that God will use to bless you. When the enemy tries to tempt you, 
or to destroy you, God, if he allows that to come to your life, is planning a great blessing for you to strengthen you so that you will be stronger in your faith and that you will be more assured of his love and his grace and that you would learn how to fight the devil. A preacher friend of mine says, great tests produce great triumphs. And he also says, faith tested is faith triumphant. So we are alert to the presence of intense joy and great joy in the New Testament. We start then to notice this spirit of joyous festivity, which is not always evident in our lives as consistently as it should be. Now, we come to the sacrifice of praise. Nehemiah 8 and verse 10 is probably the best known verse about joy. It says that God's joy in us makes us strong. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And here we have that time where God is restoring His people to their homeland and restoring them and restoring the city. Nehemiah is a, is a prophet, an architect of restoration. And we know that there were times of great repentance and sorrow as they saw how far they had gone from the grace of God and how far they had fallen from God's purposes and God's will. But Nehemiah says, the grace of God is at work here. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And, and, and Zechariah prophesies and says, grace is going to happen. This temple is going to rebuilt, be rebuilt. And God's work is going to happen. Restoration is going to take place. And so he says, don't be overly burdened by the fact that you've blown it. Repent of your sins, but quickly move into joy. Repentance is the key to the joy-filled life. Now, we can persevere in many things, but we can't persevere in much without joy. It's the joy of the Lord that will give you strength. That's why we must cultivate joy in our experience. We must say, Lord, teach me how to rejoice in you. Learn and cultivate good, godly, biblical habits of joy and rejoicing. When God commands you to rejoice, He's not telling you to switch on a feeling. There is no part of the human personality that you can press or program to produce emotions. There are certain drugs that you can take that can dampen certain centers in your brain which, can, which are overactive during certain expressions of emotion. But that is, God doesn't give us joy through drug therapy. I'm not suggesting that if somebody ever has prescribed anything like that from the doctor that they shouldn't take it, but I'm just saying there isn't, an, uh, isn't a part of our personality that we can press and say, okay, there's the joy button. Press it, and then suddenly we're joyful. There's the love button. Press it, and suddenly we're loving. Because after all, these things are not mere emotions. God does not command an emotion. He doesn't say, feel this. He says, do this. Be it. So he says, be joyful, and that means that joy is not primarily an emotion. Oh yes, there are emotions associated with joy, but it's wrong to think that if you don't have joyful emotions, that you aren't therefore called by God to rejoice, and that you mustn't think that rejoicing is absent if the feelings are absent. When Jesus died on the cross, he didn't have one nice feeling in his body, not one nice feeling of love, not one nice feeling of forgiveness. Feeling, feeling, feeling. But he was all love when he died on the cross. The cross is all about love. We wouldn't know what love is without the cross. The love is, the cross is love. See it, watch it. But he didn't have any feeling of love in his body. He was physically incapable of it at the time. So love for him was a choice and a decision. He felt bad. And sometimes love will make you feel bad because of the cost and the pain of it. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? And the same with joy. Joy is not just happy feelings. Now, I'm not suggesting that happy feelings are ruled out. I used to, used to make a joke about some uh, preacher that always used to talk about joy. He would never have any of it in his church, none of it in his services. And uh, you know, any people got happy and started to clap, he would remind them that his joy was deep joy, not the superficial joy. Well, <laughs> my joy is deep, 
but thank God it's not so deep that it doesn't come up occasionally and people can see it. And one preacher stood up and he said, how many people here have got the joy of the Lord? And everybody lifted their hands in dutiful obedience because they knew that was a scriptural thing to do. So he said, now, please tell your faces about that joy. In other words, smile, smile. And uh, when Jesus rejoiced, I'm convinced that he rejoiced with a smile on his face. Now, I'm not saying it was some fixed smile that was directly in contradiction to his circumstances and on the cross, he, 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 maybe he did smile on the cross. Maybe he did smile. Maybe he had the strength to do that. I don't know. But the essence was not the outward expression. The essence is what's your attitude of your heart. That's the essence of it. Okay, you understand what I'm saying? And I'm also saying that that essence must be expressed. If it's real, it's got to be seen. With joy you will draw water from the well of salvation, Isaiah says in chapter 12. Now, in this sort of the Spirit series, I've often referred to something that I call gospel obedience, and contrast contrasted with the obedience that often religious people call for, and the obedience that at times was evident in the Old Testament. Gospel obedience is the opposite of, of that external legalistic obedience. And without the spirit of joy, gospel obedience doesn't exist, because when we obey God, we do it with that spirit of joy. We obey him with, with, with passion. We obey him with excitement. It's wonderful. The psalmist says, I delight to do your will, O my God. I delight your will is a delight. And when Jesus came into the world, it was, this psalm was appropriate of him. When it's written in the volume of the book, when, uh, when I came into the world, it's with this declaration, I've come to delight to do your will. And so joyless obedience is a little bit like the legalistic, joyless obedience of the Jewish Pharisees and other religious folk. Our words and actions, therefore, should be characterized by intense joy and great thanksgiving, and our actions should speak of a response to God's gracious initiative. And so, all our words and deeds, if they come from Him, they must be consistent with Him, and therefore, they come already wrapped in His personal joy. So what, therefore, is the way to joy? It results from obedience, my friends. If you live in obedience, you're going to be blessed. Jesus said in Luke 11, Blessed are those who hear my will and know it and obey it and do it. That's why the New Testament calls for the costly sacrifice of praise. We do not obtain joy easily just by singing certain songs. We obtain it through sacrifice. It was purchased through blood sacrifice, the sacrifice of Jesus' blood, and it's received also through the sacrifice of gospel obedience. We find this in the teaching of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount in what we call the Beatitudes. And I went into this in detail in the seminar Glory, the, uh, uh, the rule of God, in which I dealt with this. But there we have the word makarios, which means blessed. And it stresses that this quality comes from God. Many modern translators describe this as happy because the idea suggests a large smile, makarios. That's what the word suggests, a large smile. We need to grasp these thoughts because for Jesus, when he says that he blesses us, it's because that blessedness comes from him and it's outworked in a lifestyle. As we live the life of the Sermon on the Mount, we come to a place of joy and rejoicing. And so this godly celebration can only happen in spirit and truth. It can only spring from our lives, which have been transformed by God's truth and renewed by God's Holy Spirit. And as we live according to that truth and the power of the Holy Spirit, only then can that joy come. So the Apostle Paul calls us to continuous rejoicing in Philippians chapter 4. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. Do so with thanksgiving. And that's because we know how to live without care, without pagan, craven anxiety. Don't be anxious about anything, but pray about everything. This follows on from what Jesus said, that we can trust God completely for the provision of all our needs. 
And so we know that as we let the joy of the Lord grip our hearts, it's because we've trusted in God completely to provide for us everything that we need. And so we set our hearts and our minds on all that is good and true and holy and virtuous, and we trust Him to be the God who will give us all that we need. And my God shall supply your need. That's what he says by Christ Jesus as we walk in his truth and obey him and become joyful, giving, sacrificial Christians. And so the expression of this rejoicing comes as we know that our sacrifice of our lives is acceptable to God. And so it's not just in the outward uh, expressions but this inward joy will be outwardly expressed. And so we know it's not just about following rituals, but it's about being in a joyful relationship with Jesus Christ. And so God would have us, I'm sure, reclaim so much of our life which could be swamped by joyless living, reclaim it into a wonderful time of celebration. In the study guide, I suggest ways in which we can reclaim even some of the so-called Christian festivals of Easter and Christmas and, and, and re re reclaim them from the hands of the pagan uh, expressions of so much of this to see that we can have pure, fresh, and true uh, joy. We can turn many of our family experiences and family occasions into a time of real joy and celebration. Always look for an excuse to have a Holy Ghost party. Uh, and we can see that even on the Sabbath day, when uh, they were called to, to cease from work, it was a time of joy, that God calls us also to rest in Him and to have that wonderful joy and peace as we live a life of gospel obedience. So rejoicing in the Lord gives us the strength to serve others. It provides us with the inspiration to worship Him in the ordinary detail of our lives, and it equips us with the joy to give generously to the needy and to God's work. And when we start to fill our lives with godly service, sacrifice number one, godly giving, sacrifice number two, and godly rejoicing, sacrifice number three, we will be people who are beginning to be worshippers whom the Father is seeking. We will be worshipping Him in spirit and truth. But well, we leave now these three sacrifices and we come back next time to deal with the final part of how we must learn to worship by the Holy Spirit. And when we come back, we'll be dealing with that. But right now, God bless you until you join us in the next session.